All right, well, we'll go ahead and jump in here to our study of Revelation. We're in Revelation 10. Uh, we're going to be concluding our study of that chapter and moving into chapter 11 tonight. So just as a way of reminder, we'll read chapter 10 again. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, and the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So we have been moving through this. We've seen the first three interpretive frameworks. So the last one is the idealist. That's where we are on the handout. Uh, the idealist understanding of the angel and the little scroll in that first section. Now, just as way of reminder, the idealists tend to view Revelation symbolically. Uh, they look at it as something that applies to the church in every age and believers in every place and time. And the idea is that it's not just a set of single instances that are going to happen once in a long history, but rather these are things that happen cyclically uh, within the life of the church in the world. And so the church has much to learn from each one of these because she will face these issues over and over. Now, most of them identify the angel as being exactly that a mighty angel. There are a few who see the angel as Christ, but most of them see uh, the mighty angel as a, as a very powerful angel, but an angel. And the seven thunders are the voice of God. They refer back to Psalm 29, where God's voice is described as thunder, and the voice of the Lord is used seven times in that psalm. Now, the idealists say that because John was told not to record, not to write down what the seven thunders said, the idealists say, listen, this is representative of the fact that there are certain aspects about God, about who he is and about what he will do, that just cannot be known. We will not know them. Uh, in fact, they say there are weapons in his arsenal of judgments that he can use when and how he sovereignly chooses. So these are things that, that are there uh, and are, are available to him that we do not know and cannot know. And that's just the reality about who God is. We've talked about that before. If we could know everything about God, and if we could know everything that God knows, what differentiates us from his uh, supreme omniscience? There would be nothing. But we are different from him. Now, as for the mystery that is being revealed, the mystery of God that's being revealed, the idealists understand this as the union 
between the Jews and the Greeks within the church. And this is huge, right? If you think about that, the singular body of Christ, the church, is composed of Jew and Gentile. And that is huge. Um, Paul writes extensively about that as the mystery of God being revealed in the book of Ephesians, for instance. He talks about it in Colossians. He talks about it in Romans. And, and he talks about how the Gentiles are grafted into the tree, right, uh, that is the, the people of God. Today, we just assume that to be true. I think if you were to ask most people within the church, we would just say, of course, the gospel is for everybody. The church is for everybody. But think about the first century. Think about this early church. That would have been a massive change because prior to the coming of Christ, it's the Jewish people who are God's people. Yes, there'll be some Gentiles come in. They're the righteous God-fearers. And we've got a little spot for them outside the temple, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about that in chapter 11. But you've got that court of the Gentiles. And that's good, but, but they're not completely. They're not the same as somebody who is born as a Jewish person. They don't have that same status. They're almost like a second-class believer. You can come this close to God, but don't come any closer. That's only for God's people. So for, for Paul to say, all that's gone. Now, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There are just those who are in Christ. Rather than Jew, Greek, it is in Christ, not in Christ. All those other things. And that's not to say that we don't continue to have differences. Ethnic differences, cultural differences. Of course there are. God has made us a diverse people. Uh, you look around, you see that, right? You can't help but to see that. Diversity of culture and things like that are not bad. I, for one, am very thankful that we have, uh, in our country, for instance, a Southern culture, a Midwestern culture, a Northeastern culture, a Western culture. That's just in the United States. And if you don't think there's a difference between those cultures, you haven't traveled outside the one in which you're living. Uh, the reality is that there are, and, and I know Lisa can speak to that, uh, you know, as somebody who also is from the South, like me, who's moved to the Midwest, there's a difference, right? Um, other folks have moved from different places as well, or have lived in different places. And so when we think about this as the mystery of God that's now being fulfilled, it's being revealed uh, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, isn't that what we see in the Old Testament? Messiah's coming. He's going to bring the whole world together. It's not just one little subset. He's coming for the world. And, and that's amazing. So for the Jewish people, it would have been almost inconceivable to them that God would accept the Gentiles in full, not just on the periphery, not just, yeah, you're kind of there, but in full, that would have been just amazing. And the Gentiles would have been amazed to have learned that even though God had chosen the Jewish people for himself and, and all of that, his overarching purpose was always to bring all the peoples of the world into one body that is the church. We have to understand that. And, and we can understand that where we are in redemptive history, right? Because revelation has been given to, and I mean more than just the book, all of revelation in terms of what God has revealed through the prophets, through the apostles, through the writers of scripture, all of it has been revealed. We can now see that. And we can see that his purpose was always bringing everyone into one body, 
that is the church. We sometimes think, maybe we don't consciously think this, but sometimes we can think, well, there's the Jewish people and then there's the church. And somehow God has two different plans for the Jewish people. He's got a different plan for the Jewish people. They'll, they'll come to him by some other means. It's Christ. In every way, it's Christ. No one comes to the Father but through him. And so the church is not plan two or plan one B. It is the only plan that has ever existed since before the foundation of the earth. It's always been this. And now the mystery is being fulfilled as we see people from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue coming into the church, being united in Christ, and, and, and worshiping the one true God. In heaven, it's going to happen in a much greater way than what we see here, but here we're seeing a foretaste of it. And that's a great thing. Now, the alternating sweetness and bitterness that, uh, of the book that John describes is understood by the idealists in a couple of different ways. First of all, they see the sweetness of proclaiming the gospel. There is no doubt when you're telling someone either individually or um, preaching to a group or something like that, when you're telling them about the graciousness of God in Jesus Christ, it is sweet. If I can borrow for just a moment, uh, Sunday night, we had a couple of ladies here at the church through one of the ministries of the church experience that sweetness. Would you agree that that was one of the sweetest things that you have, you experience is when you get to share the gospel with someone and, and you're there for the new birth? <laughs> it's amazing. And it never gets old. You can, you can do it a hundred million times and every time it is just as sweet as the first time or the 50th time or the hundredth time. It does not matter. It is a sweet, sweet thing. How wonderful is it that we've been given the privilege of sharing the sweetness of the gospel? But how many times do we treat it like an obligation or a duty or some kind of Oh, drudgery. Oh, I know I have to share the gospel. I don't want to. God, do I have to tell that person? Really, do I need to? It's a privilege. I, I don't know about you, but when I think of the privileges that I have, I'm excited to exercise those. I'm excited to engage in my privileges. Duties, well, those can be... <laughs> Maybe they're good, maybe they're not, but privileges are always great. Sharing the gospel is a privilege. And if you don't find that sweet, then I would encourage you to find out whether you ever really tasted the sweetness of it in the first place. I, I, I don't mean that in a harsh way. I mean it in saying that if, if sharing the gospel is not sweet to you, if that is not a great thing, then you may not understand the gospel in the first place. And to, to say that is not to be judgmental. I'm not condemning you or consigning you to hell or anything like that. But what I am saying is just like the, the, the scriptures say, you might want to check and make sure that you know the gospel in the first place. Okay, so for those of us that know the greatness of the gospel, it's unbelievable that anybody would reject it. As sweet as it is, why would anybody say no? Is it not a free gift? You don't have to do anything to earn it. It is given freely through the grace of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Why would anybody, you know, I, it's, it's interesting. I think of um, uh, Pascal's wager. If the gospel were merely a logical proposition, then Pascal's wager would be at play. And if you don't know what that is, it's simply this. 
if I accept Christ and follow him and he is not real, I've lost nothing. But if I reject him and he is real, I've lost everything. Therefore, the wager is it's better to accept Christ even if he isn't real, right? Well, if it were just logic that were involved in the gospel and believing, then everybody would probably be a believer or a lot more people would be believers than not. Uh, we would say that rational choice would lead you to that conclusion. And yet, how many people reject the gospel? Doesn't Jesus himself say, narrow is the way and few are those who find it? We, we see that. They do reject it. And so there we see two different aspects of the bitterness. First of all, the proclamation of the gospel is followed by persecution. Always. Everywhere the gospel goes, persecution follows. It's always met with persecution. If you go back through the history of the church, you find this to be true all the way back to the very beginning. How many of the apostles were martyred? All but one. And now, of course, this is tradition. We understand that. We don't have exact records, but it's a pretty good tradition. goes back to the earliest sources. Every one of the apostles, except for John, who writes the book of Revelation, was killed for proclaiming the good news in a variety of ways and in a variety of places. It's always met with that. Um, and, and sometimes that persecution is mild. Sometimes it's just, man, I wish you'd really shut up about all that Jesus stuff. But it could be martyrdom as well. Both of those options are on the table when it comes to persecution, but there's always persecution. And that doesn't mean that there aren't those who will receive it, though. There are those who will receive it. Um, and, and that's a wonderful thing. We do it because persecution will not overcome the gospel. But the second aspect of the bitterness that we see here in consuming the book comes in the announcement and the knowledge of God's judgment on the wicked. He says that those who reject him, we've already read so many of the things that he's done, right? So many of the, the ways that uh, that judgment has come. And as we continue through the book of Revelation, we're going to see that that judgment is complete. It's total. And so we, we have the bitterness there. There, there. there is no, there's no giddiness in announcing the judgment of God. But I'm sure you're like me. You've probably seen some preachers who seem to derive a perverse pleasure in preaching fire and brimstone and describing what's going to happen to those who are outside of Christ. I don't understand how you can be excited about that. If you remember last week, we read from Ezekiel 33, 11, where God says, I take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked in the death of the wicked. Um, and, and that's true in other places too, right? In the New Testament, it says, you know, God desires that all would come to redemption. That's who he is. He is loving, he is gracious, he is merciful, but he is also holy, just, and righteous. And so we see these two things. Because he is holy, just, and righteous, judgment has to come. We wish that it did not. We wish people would turn from their sins so they did not face what's coming. So that they do not go to hell. There's a bitterness there. And so when we call on people to turn from their sins and turn to life, to repent and to believe, there should be an urgency in our call. 
There should be an urgency in our, our pleas with them. And there should also be a, a great sorrow in our heart when they reject the gospel. Because we know what that means. We know how awful it will be if they fail to heed our pleas to turn and believe. And listen, if we, if we get giddy and excited about the judgment that's to come, our hearts are in the wrong place. They're not in the place where, where God's heart is. Not according to scripture, not what we see there, not at all. So, so that's the idealist approach to this particular chapter. Now let's move into chapter 11. We're going to read the first two verses tonight. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and I was told rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, we're in this chapter, we're presented with three visions. We see the vision here of measuring the temple. Then there's the vision of the two witnesses that makes up the middle portion of this chapter. And then at the end, we have the vision of the seventh trumpet that finally sounds. The interlude after the witnesses, that interlude is over, and we have the seventh trumpet uh, sounding, okay? But before we jump in, we need to understand that there are a wide range of understandings of this chapter. And in fact, many interpreters will say that this is one of the most difficult chapters to understand in all of Revelation. Because it, it has so much symbolic meaning that, and again, it's part of that interlude, right? So we're not talking about necessarily advancing the narrative of Revelation. We're talking about something else here. And so we, um, we're going to look at each one of these sections independently and understand that there are a lot of challenges to this. But that's okay. One commentator suggested that even though there's a lot of difference in interpretation, there are some things on which all students of this book can agree. One of those things is that, uh, and, and let me say too, while most people can agree to that, it's not universally held. Because I'm not sure that anything is universally held when talking about interpreting Revelation. There's just such a wide variety of understandings. I mean, we're looking at four frameworks uh, moving through this book. That's one of the reasons it takes us as long as it does. It's like going through this book four times. But even within each one of those frameworks, we've seen that there are differences among interpreters who hold to a particular framework. So, uh, so we understand that. But Generally speaking, most people hold to these, these truths. First of all, although God's people are protected spiritually, they're still susceptible to persecution. We've seen that over and over, right? God protects his people, but that doesn't mean he keeps them from being persecuted at all. And anybody who tells you that that is the case, that you don't have to suffer in this life, is a charlatan. Keep one hand on your wallet. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, that's, that's the way that those people operate. Second, God's people are called to speak prophetically. Now, that doesn't mean we're, told, we're called on to foretell the future, right? We understand that speaking prophetically is the foretelling of the truth, not the foretelling of the truth in that sense. Uh, what I mean by that is that God's people have a responsibility to speak the truth into the world unapologetically, unflinchingly, uncompromisingly. That's our role. We are light in the darkness and we are salt in this world. 
if we're going to be salt and light, we have to proclaim the truth. And we have to do so without worrying about what the response is going to be. We just need to, to, to proclaim the truth. Um, and, and that in our culture right now, we see that it is becoming increasingly more difficult to do so. And there's a part of us, I think, and a group of us, I'm not saying here, but I'm just saying within Christianity broadly understood within the Western context, there's a group who thinks this is new in the history of the church, that it is hard. Oh my goodness, it's getting harder to tell people about Jesus. And this has never been the case in the history of the world. They don't know church history. They haven't studied, they haven't read, they haven't gone through those things. We have a responsibility. It will become harder, I believe, even within our country, within our culture, to speak prophetically the truth. We see that now. Speak truthfully on matters of human sexuality today and see what happens. Speak truthfully on matters of the sanctity of life. And I don't mean just abortion. We talk about that, right? I'm talking about the sanctity of life throughout its natural course. You look around the world and you see the increase of assisted suicide, euthanasia, things like that, as though we have ultimate control and authority over our days. We do not. And that has never been our, our place. The church, God's people, is called on to speak prophetically into the world on these matters. And I know the world will tell you, you know, that we're just trying to be culture warriors. Now, that's a danger. We have to be clear that we're not defending our culture, but that we're defending the scripture. This, this should be our culture. Not Americanism, not Southern life. And listen, I know I'm a, I'm a Southern guy. I get it. But that's, that cannot be my culture. My culture must be this. Your culture must be this. And this is the culture. If, if we're warriors for a culture, let it be this culture. Let us be defenders of this, not of anything else. The world will react with hostility to the church's prophetic witness. That's a given. That's a given. Because if we're truly speaking about the, um, the change that the gospel brings, the world doesn't want that. The world does not want to hear that. In addition, in this chapter, we see the truth that God raises his people from the dead and that he will reverse their temporary defeat at the hands of evil powers. One of the biggest questions that we hear so often that I hear is why do bad things or why are they always happening? Why does evil always seem to prevail? And if you look at the world, it sometimes does look that way. But one of the truths we can take from this chapter is that it is not permanent. Evil does not win in the end. God wins. And if we're with him, we win. The witnessing church also possesses tremendous power and authority to carry out its mission. When we do get to the two witnesses, we're going to see that. They... There's nothing that can happen to them as long as it is time for them to carry out their mission. God sees to that. Okay, but there comes a time when the mission is accomplished. Our work is done. Okay, but that's not the end. So as we consider this first vision, we're going to see that, that John is given a long measuring stick and he's gone, he goes to make an unusual measurement. He makes an unusual measurement here. 
And so like much of, the, uh, much of Revelation, we see some echoes of the Old Testament here, right? What we see here is a reminder of the measurement that Ezekiel is told to make in chapters 40 through 48 of his book. He's taken up on a very high mountain and he's, he's shown the new temple uh, and the final temple. And he does not make the measurement himself. An angel makes it and announces that measurement back to Ezekiel. In this situation, it's John who's told to make the measurement. In Ezekiel, he gives the measurements. In this, we don't see what the linear measurements are. Not yet. Now, there's going to come a time later in chapter 21 where we get the measurements for the new Jerusalem, but not the temple. In fact, in 21, it says there is no temple in the new Jerusalem because God is there. So, so that's, a, that's an amazing thing too, right? And as we get into some of the different frameworks, we're going to see that this understanding of the temple, some people think it's a physical earthly temple. Some people think it's a spiritual temple. Some people think it's the people of God. And we'll talk about why that is, okay? Uh, and so how should we understand that? Well, we need to understand that in history, first of all, there are two physical temples that were constructed. There was Solomon's temple that was built, was magnificent. We read about it in the Old Testament books of Kings. And, and then we know that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, when they come into Jerusalem and, and take the city, they destroy the temple. They raise it. They take everything out of it, the instruments, all of the, uh, the furnishings of the temple, the gold, and they cart it back to Babylon. Then after the 70 years of exile, when the Jewish people return, there's no temple, right? Zerubbabel, who comes back, leads in rebuilding the temple. But it says that those who were alive who remembered the old temple cried when they saw it because it did not approximate the former glory of Solomon's temple. You fast forward in time and you get to the point of Herod the Great and Herod the Great wanted to make a big name for himself and he wanted to do it through building projects. And what is the greatest thing within the life of Israel? The temple, absolutely. And so he wants to make the temple even grander than it was in the time of Solomon. And so he embarks on building onto the temple, enlarging it, expanding it, making it more magnificent. Now, some people say that's the third building of the temple, but the reason we don't count it as a third building is because the temple never ceased to operate during the construction. Everything continued every day even while Herod was building. And so it's a continuation of the second temple. But that temple was destroyed as well in AD 70 when the Romans come in and they're responding to the Jewish revolt that began in about AD 66. And they come into Jerusalem, they destroy the temple, they raise it to the ground, and to this day, there has never been another temple built in that place. We know where it is. The Western Wall still stands. The Wailing Wall, you might have heard it called. And today, sitting at the Temple Mount is an Islamic mosque. The Mosque of the Dome of the Rock, right? Um, you have that there. And there's a lot of argument, um, but there are some who believe that there will be a physical third temple built in that same spot. And, you know, if, you're, if you've been around for very much time and you've followed anything that's 
eschatological in articles or anything like that. You'll hear rumors of that every now and then. Um, I can tell you that I hear that a lot uh, from some folks I know. They'll say, hey, I heard a rabbi talking on a, a talk show, and he said they found some red heifers, and they're getting ready to do the sacrifices again, and they're going to get the ashes and sprinkle it to consecrate the ground, and then they're going to rebuild the temple. And I'm like, okay, okay. Uh, I, I don't see how that's going to happen anytime soon. I'm just, uh, I'm just being, from my perspective, as I look at the geopolitical environment of Jerusalem and that area, I don't see where uh, the Muslim people are going to acquiesce to the destruction of the mosque that's there and the rebuilding of a Jewish temple. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that something could not happen that changes all of that. I'm just saying I don't see it on the horizon. Um, I don't see it in the foreseeable future. That's, that's just where I am. Uh, some people will certainly disagree with me. And as with many things in Revelation, that's okay. That's fine. So before we get into that question a little bit more in terms of what the, is this a physical temple? Is it something else? Um, I think we need to take a moment to consider what measuring means in, uh, in the Old Testament and in the prophetic literature. When the prophets were commanded to measure something, they were being told that this was something that is protected by God. When God calls on the prophets to measure something, and that it may be something that exists or does not yet exist. Think of the temple for Ezekiel. When Ezekiel was told to go up and look at the temple, it was a future temple. It was not a temple that existed at that moment. And he was told to measure, well, the angel measured it, right? And in doing so, it indicated that that belonged to God. And when he owns it, when it's his, he protects it and he preserves it. So whatever this is, we're being reminded that it is owned by God and it is uh, under his sovereignty. And so for the people in the Old Testament when they would read the prophetic literature about that, remember these are people who are either about to go into exile, are in exile, or maybe have just gotten out of exile. It depends upon which prophetic book you're reading. But regardless, when they read about these things, they are being reminded and encouraged and comforted that the destruction that either is going to happen or has happened is not the last word. Okay, that destruction isn't permanent, and there will be a restitution. There will be a rebuilding here. And that even though they are going to be rebuilt and restored, it doesn't mean they're going to be spared from all the suffering that they face in this world. Okay, that's going to happen, but still, there's coming an ultimate, a complete, and a permanent restoration. So there's several who've taken this uh, as meaning that there will be a future temple built. We've, we've seen that. Uh, some have suggested that it will take place prior, just prior to the events of Revelation, that there will be a temple built. And once the sacrifices start up again, then you know that the events of Revelation are about to happen. Okay, so that's one perspective people have had. Others have said, no, this is going to be a temple that exists during the millennial reign of Christ, during the thousand years. Uh, and it's going to be that kind of temple. Um, and some see both, that there will be the physical temple and then there'll be the, the millennial temple as well. But others have viewed this as referencing the church. And here's why. In the New Testament, any time the writers of the New Testament refer to the temple of God, it's the people of God. Everywhere that it talks about the temple or the sanctuary, 
in the New Testament, it's referring to the people of God. At least when we think about it in, in terms of um, not referring in the Gospels to the literal temple, right? We're talking about the things that come after that. Let me give you a few examples from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Um, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. I don't know how much clearer Paul can be than that. And he's writing, don't forget, he's writing this to the Corinthians while the physical temple still stands in Jerusalem. Everything is rolling along just as it had for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right? The sacrifices are being made. Incense is being burned. Everything is taking place there. Songs are being sung by the Levitical priests. It's all happening just as it always had been. And Paul says, you're the temple. God's spirit doesn't dwell in the physical building, in the Holy of Holies. The Shekinah glory is not there. He is in you. You are that temple. Okay, so there's 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. The next place I want you to see is Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Paul says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So once again, you see that we're being knitted together as living bricks in the temple of God. That's the church. And then 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10, this is a little bit longer, but, but Peter quotes some Old Testament in this. He said, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What a beautiful picture of the church that is. You are God's people. You have been received. Once you did not have mercy, now you have mercy. Once you were not God's people, now you are his people. And, and for such, John, to measure this temple, for him to do this, is to say the church is protected. It, it will persevere. He's thinking of Jesus who said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Nothing can overcome it. And no matter what, even, even though there's going to be times of great suffering, the church, with the capital C, is invincible. <laughs> it's invincible. I, I, I chose that word very carefully. It cannot be overcome. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot die. The church will prevail because it is the body of Christ. It is the bride of Christ. And if you think he's going to let anything happen to that, 
you don't know Jesus. That is just not how it is. And in fact, in Revelation, we see that as well. Uh, it says here that John is to measure the temple and the altar. Well, the altar has been mentioned in Revelation already. Revelation 6, 9 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So we see the martyrs there. Part of the church. They gave their life for Christ. They're under the altar. And that's part of what's measured here. And then in Revelation 8, 3 and 4, And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God and from the hand of the angel. So you see here once again that altar, that place where uh, there's worship taking place, but also where they're suffering from the martyrs, from the prayers of God's people that are lifted up during times of persecution, and they're there. So to this, it has the added support of seeing that John also was told to measure not just the temple and the altar, but those who worship there. It's measuring people. That's unusual when you're looking to measure something like this. But I want you to notice there's also an exclusion here. John is explicitly told not to measure the outer court of the temple. This was known as the court of the Gentiles. And it was the outermost court around the temple complex. It was where the righteous believers who were Gentiles could come, but they could go no further. They could not pass. And in fact, separating the outer court, the court of the Gentiles from the rest of the temple complex was about a waist high wall, right? So the Gentiles could see in, but they could not pass that wall. And at every gate, that went into the inner courts of the temple, there was a stone that was there, and it was carved in Greek. I want to show you. We have an example. We have found this. It, it's uh, this one is at the uh, at a museum in Turkey. There's also one at a museum in Jerusalem, but this stone has some Greek written there, and I want to tell you what it says. It says, no foreigner is to enter within the balustrade and forecourt around the sacred precinct. Whoever is caught will himself be responsible for his consequent death. All right? This is a no trespassing sign. Do not step beyond this point or you will die and it will be your fault. You have been warned. Yes, Isaac. This is exactly that. This is exactly where in Acts, when Paul is arrested uh, in Jerusalem, uh, it was assumed that he had brought a Gentile past this point into the inner courts. And so the Jewish people wanted to kill Paul as a result of that. Paul was a Roman citizen, however, and, and so he was afforded certain protections as such uh, that the Jewish people... Uh, couldn't do. Um, but generally speaking, the Jewish people and the, the chief priests and those who oversaw the Sanhedrin and everything were afforded by the Romans the authority to kill anybody who stepped through this point. This is also what Paul is referencing in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 16. I want you to see these. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, 
alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That is a dire description. You are, you are outside. You are outside. But it gets better. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That's that, that wall that separated the Gentiles from the inner courts, the dividing wall of hostility. And he did so by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Praise God. That is wonderful. That's what we have here. And so if to measure meant that God was declaring protection then to not measure meant that you were excluded from that portion. You were cast out. In fact, that's what the Greek word means here, where, where it says, leave them out. Um, where it says, uh, do not measure the court outside the temple, leave that out. Leave that out literally means cast out. This is the same Greek word here that is used in the Gospels every time it talks about Jesus casting out evil spirits or demons from people. It's also the word that's used when Jesus casts out the money changers from the temple. They're cast out. And it's also used in another passage from Luke when Jesus is speaking, Luke 13, 24 through 29 says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Remember, he's talking to the Jewish leaders here. And he's saying, you're going to come and you're going to say, let us in. We were there. You taught in our streets. And he's, I don't know you, you workers of lawlessness. And yet, all these other people from east and west, north and south, Gentiles, will come in to the kingdom of God with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And you will be cast out. So this is, this is another aspect here. Um, and, and so we see that the unbelieving who continue to, continue to rebel against God and his commandments and his authority, they're going to be cast out. They're going to be left out of the portion of the protection of God. They're not part of the sanctuary. Now, another interesting aspect in these two verses is the... Um, uh, the fact that John says the holy city is going to be um, um, trampled by the nations or unbelievers for 42 months, which is three and a half years. 42 months, three and a half years. Uh, and this is reminiscent of Daniel's description of time periods. If you'll remember in his book, he says a time, times, and half a time. A year, two years, and half a year adds up to three and a half years. Okay, so, so we see this kind of echoing again of the Old Testament. And again, the different frameworks look at this 
uh, in different ways. Some of them see it as an indeterminate amount of time. Some see it as literally three and a half years. Uh, some see it as the time between Jesus' resurrection and his return. And we're going to dig into those when we look at those different frameworks as well. Uh, but we're out of time for tonight. So we will have to pick up with the uh, different frameworks understanding when we meet again. So let's go ahead and pray and dismiss. Father, we thank you so much that you are the one who is in control of all history. You stand sovereign over time and that all of the works and plans of kings and nations, they think that they're plotting, they think that they're planning, and yet it is you who guides their decisions. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your omnipotence. We thank you for your omniscience. Lord, as we read these passages, I know that there are times where the bitterness of them is hard for us to, to, to think about when it comes to your judgment on those who are outside of your grace. But Father, that just means that we need to share the sweetness of the gospel all the more. I pray that we are not afraid to do so, that we are glad to do so. And Lord, may we find comfort in knowing that you give divine protection to your people in all places and at all times as they are about the mission that you have given them. Father, we do pray tonight as we're studying Revelation and the end times, we pray just as John did at the end of this book. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's in his name and for his glory we ask these things. Amen.